in to the Community Cats Podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I have been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we are speaking with Ollie Davidson. Ollie is one half of the folk duo Almond and Olive. He has worked in animal rescue and welfare for 16 years, most recently as a director of programs, operations, and digital marketing, and currently consulting with animal groups that make a difference, like the Concern for Helping Animals in Israel. The other half of the duo is Natalie Alms, who also works in the field of animal welfare. Considering their work for animals, they've decided to donate a portion of the proceeds of their debut album to the Jackson Galaxy Foundation. They've worked with Jackson in the past on a few projects, and so they're happy to be able to generate exposure for his foundation. Ollie, I want to welcome you to the show. Great to be here, Stacey. Thank you. So, Ali, how did you get started in animal welfare and getting involved with uh, community cats? You know, it's um, it was pretty organic for my whole life. I've been I was raised with animals. I mean, when I was a kid, my grandma had two dogs, four cats, a parrot, and my goal every time I spent the night at her house was to have them all sleep with me in the same bed. <laughs> not the not the parrot, of course, but to get as many of the other animals as possible. Um, so, you know, I, I've had this, I guess, love of animals my whole life. And as I got older, I started walking dogs in my early 20s. And just just the idea of, of caring for other animals, I think, got me thinking, like, what else What else could I do within the animal welfare field? And I found a job at a local animal shelter to uh, work in the clinic, pilling animals, giving them fluids. Um, and, and then from there, I just kind of worked my way up through the ranks of animal welfare and found myself as, uh, like you mentioned, the director of programs, operations, and digital marketing. And through my time in working with animals, uh, animal welfare and cats specifically is really is really what I've, I've been working with with the past 16 years. We've done a lot of great things with the community cats programs. And a few times a year or a few times I've been to the um, Animal Care Expo for HSUS. I've done some presentations on volunteering. So just kind of uh, totally immersed in, in the whole animal welfare community. And But you're also a musician, too. And have you always been doing music? Yeah, probably since uh, I was about 15. I, I found my dad's old guitar that he bought at a garage sale for a quarter and started playing um, R.E.M.'s Losing My Religion. I think I just played one string. There's this, there's this little uh, melody sequence in the song that I kind of learned. And from there, just started writing my own music. I, I never took lessons. I think innately I was, it just was part of me. My, my parents were always playing records, Bob Dylan, the Beatles. Uh, my dad seemingly was always introducing me to new music. I think he introduced me to Nirvana, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so I just kind of was, it was kind of part of my blood and just kept playing along the way. Like, obviously the day job was working with animals, but I would, you know, gig at night and just continue to write music. And, and finally, I think now with, with meeting Natalie, as you mentioned, my partner in Almond and Olive, have finally found um, the right combination of creativity and, and, a, and a partner to play with. And I think we're going to do some good stuff. That's excellent. That's great. And one thing I actually think is a really good point to make, the animal welfare world can be pretty stressful and it can be very emotional. And by having music as an outlet, it probably helped you with sort of the longevity of being able to sort of stay in the business. It's very stressful indeed. I mean, part of what, one of the first things I did as in, in animal welfare uh, was was taking uh, field requests from from people who found cats or needed to relinquish cats, and I needed to find them immediate placement. And that wasn't always possible given the circumstances because I, I worked at a no kill facility at that time, and the space was limited. And so you'd have to, to counsel people to try to find them a solution that they could live with. And, and a lot of times they didn't have any other options. They only could bring the cat to you or that was it, at least in their mind. And they were very upset and very stressed out. And the cats that came to the shelter sometimes were injured. So it stressed out the staff seeing the injuries and, and trying to keep these cats alive. And you're right, having this outlet, this creative outlet to kind of go home and, and, and decompress with, uh, I think really make made a big difference in, in my ability to kind of keep keep going. For me, it was uh, tennis. I'm a big tennis player. 
And so I would, you know, when I needed to, I would get on the court. I also played racquetball and squash. And so, you know, you can just go and smack that ball around and you, it takes your mind off things. I agree. I agree. I think that it's very important in, in this business to not totally immerse yourself 24 hours a day because it, it does take a toll. And I've seen plenty of people, good people burn out because of it. Yeah. And that creativity is good. And you never know, you know, while you're doing something, you'll come off, you know, I'll come off the court and I'll be like, oh, that was, that's so easy. I could totally figure that out. So you get a whole different perspective. It just changes your overall view of the world. But let me uh, take you back. So you are working on this album um, with Natalie. What type of music do you play? Uh, we're we're folk music, Mumford and Sons, Lumineers, uh, uh, those that sort of genre. We write songs together. Sometimes Natalie takes the lead. Sometimes we're singing together. Um, I think two of the best things about our group are would be her voice is timeless. I feel it's just one of these voices that you hear and it just it's it's beautiful right away. And then I think that we write really, really good songs. I think we, we're blessed with the ability to, to craft good music and our singing style together, our, our ability to play together is something that I think is pretty hard to find in this sort of business. You know, you can collaborate with all kinds of people, but to have somebody that you are playing with that is almost your twin, in effect, who, who can kind of know when you're going to go up and know when you're going to go a certain direction is just pretty, pretty remarkable and unique. So, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's in the folk genre. I mean, I, you know, we have banjo and violin and, and acoustic guitars and we even got a pedal steel in there. So it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty nice. And this is your debut album, and you have decided to donate part of the proceeds to the Jackson Galaxy Foundation. Uh, have you worked with Jackson Galaxy before? Yeah, uh, I met Jackson Galaxy probably about four or five years ago at an event. Kind of hit it off uh, right away and kept in touch through the years and was was really excited to have this opportunity to to utilize the funds from the sale of our debut album to help his his foundation, his new foundation, because what the Jackson Galaxy Foundation does is they assist shelters all across the country by updating housing that may be crumbling, getting animals adopted, enhancing those programs, as well as creating community programs like TNR and Community Cats that will allow uh, cats to be managed uh, in, in, in cities and neighborhoods where they aren't being cared for. So I think one of the reasons why it kind of was natural for me to do this and for Natalie and I to do this is, for the most part, when I create or when I put on shows in the past, I've always tried to find somebody to benefit. Uh, because for me, I think giving back should be part of your creative process. You know, it makes me feel good that it's not just about me or our group. It's also about raising awareness. So having a platform to raise awareness. And Jackson Galaxy has done so much for, for cats and, and it's just, it, it really makes sense for us. And we're really honored to be able to, to help raise awareness for JGF and, and hopefully get them some good funding. And you've had a Kickstarter campaign um, go off that has at this point in time closed. Um, do you have a, like a fundraising objective or goal that you hope to reach? Yeah, the Kickstarter campaign, it was, was a, a great success. And our, our goal is, you know, it's it's hard to say because I really believe this record is going to be phenomenal and people are going to people are going to like it. It just the, the returns from the rough mixes sound really great and I, and we're getting some good feedback. So if that's the case and people start snapping it up, we're going to be able to raise a, a, a whole lot of money. But I would be really happy if we could at least knock out five thousand dollars in the first couple of months to to give the Jackson Galaxies Foundation because I think that would be a good starting point. And you know anything more than that, I think would be great. Yeah, well, we'll see what we can do here at the community cats podcast to help support that uh, effort and help raise some good money for the jackson galaxy foundation and now let's take a moment to listen to a few words from our sponsors ready to make a big difference for cats in your community we've got an exciting opportunity that can jumpstart your efforts the community cats podcast has launched community cats grants when you qualify for this innovative program you'll gain valuable knowledge about how to raise funds for your spay-neuter efforts. Plus, we'll match the funds you raise up to $1,000, doubling your ability to make a difference for cats. Fundraising doesn't have to be scary. We'll be with you every step of the way. Check it out. You can find all of the details on the Community Cats podcast website under our education menu. Let's join forces to make the world a better place for community cats. Get out of this town, 
drive out of the city Away from the crowds I thought heaven can help me now Nothing lasts forever But this is gonna take me down He's so tall and handsome as hell He's so bad but he does it so well I can see the end as it begins My one condition there Say you'll remember me Standing in a nice dress Staring at the sunset, babe Red lips and rosy cheeks Say you'll see me again Even if it's just in your wildest dreams Oh Wildest dreams Oh I said no one has to know what we do His hands are in my hair, his clothes are in my room And his voice is a familiar sound Nothing lasts forever But this is getting good now He's so tall and handsome as hell He's so bad but he does so well When we've had our very last kiss My last request is Say you'll remember me Standing in a nice dress Staring at the sunset Baby, red lips and rosy cheeks Say you'll see me again Even if it's just in your You had also mentioned that you are a consultant at this point in time, and you had also mentioned you've done some presentations at HSUS's expo. Over the years, what's been your experience in working with with nonprofits? It sounds like you specialize in the realm of volunteering, or or do you cover all the aspects? I do everything from (laughs) programs to digital marketing to to fundraising. Yeah, it's it's in my time I've been involved in, in. Pretty much everything. I think the biggest challenge with nonprofits would be, I believe, probably the board, uh, nonprofit boards, because you have line level people who are working in the trenches, who are getting things done, who know what the needs are of the organization. But a lot of times boards are pretty disconnected from what the organization needs. And so a lot of their expectations and what they feel that they are doing or should be doing don't really jibe with the actual needs of the organization. So it's, it's finding the right balance to ensure that the board is aware and able to help because primarily the job of a board is fundraising. And it seems like, unfortunately, what I, what I hear when, in my consulting 
is that a lot of boards micromanage and uh, try to take over these little minute details that really that's why you hire these great staff members to do. So keep your board fundraising and then focus the staff on getting uh, getting these things accomplished. Right now I'm working with uh, the Concern for Helping Animals in Israel um, High. They have some great programs where they are uh, they have teachers going into schools talking about compassion, compassionate choices, making sure the, the, the students understand why animals are valuable and how to treat them properly. So that's pretty exciting for me. I also work locally for a group called Friends of Animal Care and Control. And what we do for friends is we um, ensure that the comfort of the animals at the city uh, pound have all the, their needs met. And so consulting for me has really opened up the opportunity to help smaller nonprofits um, reach their fundraising goals, to enhance their volunteer programs. Like you mentioned at the HSUS Animal Care Expo, I presented on volunteer issues. Um, shout out to my friend uh, Hillary Hager over there at HSUS. She's been a, a great uh, mentor to me. And I just really, I really feel like this is the opportunity to to kind of show animal welfare organizations how they can reach their goals, how they can enhance their programs, and and do the things they need to do for digital marketing. I actually offer a, a visioning workshop program for some of the smaller uh, organizations. Basically, it's I call it sort of strategic planning in half a day, and it helps hmm. get the boards and the staff on the same wavelength as to what the objectives are. And it's so simple that, you know, it's a one page document. And I basically say, you know, put it on your refrigerator, you know, so everybody can see it so that then your top three goals are always there. And the board is focused on those top three goals and not looking at some of the smaller issues. That's exactly right. I mean, that's the biggest problem that we've seen is that, you know, I I think when you hire great staff members, they're there to do a job. And Primarily, these guys don't make a lot of money because they're they are in a, a nonprofit environment, but they do the majority of the great work that these organizations do, and they're working seven days a week, 12, 13 hour days. So, I think it's important for boards to understand the role of these staff members and to give them the leeway to get the job done, and then spend the majority of their time gaining exposure for the organization and raising funds. And there is also more governance that's necessary at the board level now than there was maybe ten or fifteen years ago. Right. Exactly, exactly. So they have to be a little bit more wary on the governance issues, and and those are a different kind of set of uh, hats, um, I I think, too. If an organization knew of a uh, musical group in their community and they wanted to form a partnership, would you have any sort of recommended tips on how to work with a musical group? Yeah, I think that this is, I think a model that nonprofits should really strive to get under their belt would be to figure out who in their community is like-minded for whatever their goal is. And then since we're talking about cats specifically, who, who in your community has, has maybe posted on their Facebook page, uh, you know, them playing, playing some music with their cat, or they posted a picture of their cat in their home, approach those, those groups, those artists and figure out, Hey, you know, you're, you, you love animals. It looks like we really have a, a great fundraiser coming up. We'd love for you to come out and do a show or do a, a book release or something like that, where you can kind of work together and sell the fact that in partnering, you, you pool resources. So whatever fans that they have and whatever supporters you have, you guys are together putting out um, a press release and you're getting fans from both sides to see what you do. And it's a win-win for everybody. So my best tip would be just to look in your community, find like-minded individuals who, who kind of think like you do for the, for the cause that you have. And then, you know, just approach them like a regular person. Say you're a fan and you like to work with them. So I'm going to bring uh, bring it back a little bit and ask you a question I ask many of my guests on the show. If you saw a stray cat on the street, what would you do? <laughs> well, that's a good point. Um, <laughs> I, in my backyard, have uh, probably about eight regular colony cats that gotten fixed. We've gotten fixed over the years. Um, I think that the first th- thing we do is, if I, if I were to find a cat that, that came up to me, determine if it's friendly or feral. A friendly cat, it's probably a good idea to, you know, is there a collar? Are there signs around? It's, it's, a, it's a tough thing because a lot of times in my business, when, it, when, when somebody would find a cat, they bring it in and they bring it to a shelter where that cat was just outside potentially for a half hour because their owner let him outside. And so now that cat is in the system. They maybe, didn't, maybe they don't have a microchip. Now you have to worry about how they're going to be reunited. So my, my advice to, the, to our, the counselors when I was supervising our calls of this nature would be to tell them, give it a little bit of time. Supervise the cat outside. Make sure that it's not in danger. If the cat's in immediate danger, obviously get it out of that immediate danger. But if they, are, if they look okay, they look healthy, they seem to know what they're doing, keep an eye on them. Knock on some doors to your neighbors. Hey, is this your cat? Look for signs. 
And then, you know, pick up the cat, take it to a, a vet and, and see if there's a microchip because that can also lead you to where the next step is too. For a feral cat, it's probably best to find out if there's a, a colony in your area where somebody is managing because then you could talk to that person and get them in whatever um, community cats program exists for that for that neck of the woods. And if not, you know, consider a colony in your backyard. If this cat's kind of been hanging around for a while and he, and he's, and he or she is feral but, you know, wants to get some food and you feel like you have the right environment to provide the housing and the, and the, and the feeding and, and obviously the, the vet care, spay, neuter, surgery, do that. Get a community cats pro, uh, colony in your backyard. And how long have you had your colony? About 10 years. So they should be getting kind of up there in age, huh? You know, what's crazy is that these cats look fantastic. <laughs> I mean, their coats look great. They're, they're kind of plump and happy. And there are cats that kind of come and go. But there's been a core there of about eight cats that just have been living there for 10 years. And they look really, really great. So I think it's a testament to wh- why community cats programs work. As long as you have somebody in the neighborhood who knows how to care for them, knows how to give that vet care and, and knows about the feeding guidelines and the safety guidelines. But, you know, these cats are perfectly fine. They live in the backyard and they don't hurt anybody. And, and it's less cats that go into a system of animal care and control, which, you know, as, as we all know, in community cats is, is a drain on the city's resources. So I'm a real proponent of, of outdoor feral colonies. That's for sure. Excellent. If people are interested in finding out more about your album and about you and Natalie, how can they find you? Well, two ways. You can go to our website, almondolivemusic.com, or go to our Facebook page, which is Almond Olive Music as well. So it's Facebook forward slash Almond Olive Music. Take a look. Follow us. See what we're up to. We'd love to hear from you. Um, tell us what kind of cats you have, and maybe we'll, we'll uh, post your, your picture on social media. Oh, that sounds great. Ollie, is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners today? Well, in about probably three months, and we'll keep you guys updated through the through the podcast here, but we're going to be releasing the album. And once we do, we'd love for you guys to purchase it because, like we said, uh, the initial proceeds are going to the Jackson Galaxy Foundation, which is a great cause, and we love to raise as much money as possible. That's great. Yes, do keep us updated, and we'll make sure we get that out all across our social media and up on our website, too. Ali, I wanted to thank you so much for being a guest on the show, and uh, hopefully you will come on the show and uh, keep us updated on how things are going. For sure, Stacey. It was a great time. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Community Cats podcast. I would really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes, leave a review of the show. It will help spread the word to help more community cats. 